So good morning to all. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're uh, grateful that you're here this morning. I think we have a very good lineup of uh, uh, people from across the in industry uh, that have uh, had a contribution to the reduction or the research or uh, different uh, aspects of the industry to help reduce the plastics and cotton. Uh, this is our third installment of plastics and cotton and trying to uh, uh, look at uh, educational means to help with the uh, uh, reduction of the of the plastics. Uh, this time, uh, well, I'm Bob McCool. I'm the uh, County Extension Ag Natural Resource Agent in uh, San Patricio County. Also, uh, on with us today is Jaime Lopez, and he's the uh, County Extension Agent and Ag Natural Resources Agent in Nueces County. So uh, again, welcome to all. Uh, just want to uh, take care of a few things. If you have questions, uh, we do have someone monitoring the chat. So uh, if you have a question, uh, feel free to put that in the chat box. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, Back in 2020, our crops committees in San Patricio and New Asis had uh, uh, give us, given us a task to uh, uh, do some uh, educational uh, efforts toward this uh, issue that had been becoming a, a problem uh, within this area. So uh, uh, New Asis, San Patricio got together and, and started uh, having this deal. It was intended to be just a a uh, kind of a county area type program and COVID hit and we put it uh, out on Zoom and, and got a big response. So uh, we've uh, continued the effort to, to this, uh, to this uh, moment. So uh, according as our agenda, if you have agenda, uh, you know, we had a moving forward uh, kind of theme to this. And, and there again, that's kind of where we're wanting to go is we've tried to, to move the information and the educational aspect uh, down the road, and 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 hopefully uh, it 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 is and has made a difference in the past. So, uh, with that said, uh, our first uh, speaker this morning is Jeff Nunley. He's the executive director of uh, South Texas Cotton and Grain Association, and uh, we're thankful that he's able to be with us this morning. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Nunley. Well, thank you, Bobby, and uh, thank you to all of you that are on the the seminar this morning, uh, I want to express my appreciation to Bobby McCool, uh, Jason Ott, who is a former uh, Ag Extension Agent in Nueces County, and Jaime Lopez, um, who's the current Extension Agent in Nueces County, for their work on this, because I think it is important to raise uh, the work they've done in raising the awareness of this issue and uh, trying to get information to producers and the industry on how to address the problem. I'd also like to thank the National Cotton Council. Uh, they've done a really good job in providing resources and educational tools that are available to producers uh, in their videos and, and, and educational materials on how to address uh, and reduce plastic and cotton. And Cotton Incorporated, who uh, funds research on this issue uh, using uh, checkoff dollars uh, uh, it's you know basically self-funded help on that from the producer standpoint. Um, you know, I still remember clearly whenever uh, I saw the the chart that showed uh, plastic and cotton is such a problem, particularly for the Corpus Christi office, which is our area. Um, you know, and some of that could be because the onboard moduling systems have been so uh, rapidly and widely adopted in our area um, that, uh, you know, that, that problem could have been exacerbated by that. Um, and I've said from the outset, this is not a, this is not just a producer problem or a gender problem. Um, it's an everybody problem. We all need to work uh, to address it and, and uh, be diligent in our efforts to reduce plastic contamination in cotton. I think the industry has done a really good job in developing um, not only resources, but identifying best management practices on, on how we can reduce pra uh, plastic and cotton. The challenge now is though, because we have a lot of these um, best management practices out there is making sure that as producers and generous and, and all the people in this, in this uh, process, 
that we adopt those practices and, and, and make sure that we, uh, we do our part um, to be part of the solution. You know, we see it, I mean, just as an example, we know that you don't want to sit round modules on shredded cotton stalks because that causes a problem, but we still see it, you know, and, and some of that is because in the heat of the moment or the fog of war of, of harvest, you know, you, you, you're, you're rushing around taking care of stuff and, and some of those things don't seem as important then. And, um, and so those things happen. Um, some of these things could be addressed really and truly by, you know, making these plans well in advance before you put seed in the ground, have, have an idea of, of some of the things that you're gonna do throughout the season, making sure that the equipment is, is set and adjusted properly, making sure that you have, uh, you know, you've identified locations for staging modules that, um, you know, will prevent damage and also be accessible to the module trucks. I know my generous have said that, you know, that's, that's always an issue for them is being able to get to those modules and, um, and have them in a place that, you know, where I know some disking is one way that, that producers have, have used to knock down the shredded stalks, but, uh, you know, if we get a rain in South Texas, all of a sudden that becomes a real problem for module trucks too. So I, I don't know what the answer is on that, but I'm, I'm sure that, um, there's, that we'll find a solution on how to do that. And some of it is just, like I said, it's just planning ahead, making some of those decisions early on before you arrive at that moment. And, and those things get put to the, put to the side because, you know, of time constraints or whatever during harvest. Um, Bobby, I appreciate you uh, putting this meeting together. Um, you've done a great job over the last three years on this. And we have conversations um, periodically through the year as, as things arise that, that Bobby happens to think about or I think about um, and some of those get incorporated into this stuff. I look forward to the to the seminar today. It, Bobby's done a really good job of putting together a lineup of great speakers and um, I look forward to the information they had to share. So um, thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Jeff. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, being with us this morning and uh, uh, Jeff uh, supports us down here in a, in a big way and we appreciate uh, all he does for, for uh, us and the producers. So uh, uh, again, thank you and thank you for being on this morning. As, as we move forward, uh, I also forgot, I, I, Lindsay Shepard is, uh, is with us in College Station and she's helping uh, keep this meeting rolling this morning and just wanna thank her as well. Uh, so uh, she does a lot for us and just wanted to acknowledge that uh, uh, she is helping uh, make this happen. So with that said, uh, again, if you, if you have anything or any questions for anybody, just feel free to put them in the chat and, and we'll go from there. So our next speaker is uh, Kelly Green. He's, with the, he's president of the Texas Cotton Jenners Association. And uh, we asked him to come and kind of give a, a perspective from, you know, the overall gen perspective uh, throughout Texas. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Green. Thank you very much, Bobby, for inviting me um, to, to speak at this session. And, and um, I'm, I think it's great that we have so many participants on here. I, one of the biggest hurdles is just keeping this in front of everyone and keeping it on, I think, keeping it on everyone's mind. Um, just like with 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 um, the overall quality of cotton, I mean, every step along the way, we can degrade the quality. Um, and it's the same with plastic. We've got to look at every step from the minute it comes off the plant until it's um, getting into the gin. I think really the where we need to concentrate is, is from the module feeder cylinders back um, to the plant. And there's things different people can do along the line, but also, um, like Jeff said, just just keeping that whole chain in mind and figuring out, um, you know, what we can do anywhere along the line to, to preserve that quality to the best extent that we can. Um, obviously, on the module feeder, that the module feeder cylinders, that, that seems to be our, our um, from a Jenner standpoint, that seems to be the best place that we've got to, to keep an eye on the contamination and monitor it. Um, we have 
technology now where we can we can watch those cylinders, um, you know, with with cameras. Even though there's a problem with that, in that you've got to pause the feed long enough to be able to see it. But I think um, Jenner's keeping in mind and keeping an eye on those cylinders as, as best they can, checking them regularly. Um, of course, get going going back a step, catching it on the on the roller beds. That's that's where we can actually catch um, any broken plastic. And um, having them, having our guys trained, the guys that are doing the unwrapping, having them trained. Is that? Mr. Green's feed that quit or we all quit? That was Kelly. I think okay. um, he's, he's froze up for just a second. Maybe he'll come. Okay, we'll, we'll give him a minute and hopefully, hopefully that changes. I think he's at uh, Plains Cotton Growers office. So I'm sure Sean Wade is handling his technology right now. Okay, he's back. <laughs> Sean's already been in here twice. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully that will end of my uh, blinking on and off. Um, we've got a, a member that that's actually looking at some camera systems on their on their uh, yard movers that would that would keep an eye out for for uh, torn modules and and um, damage to the wrap um, out on the yard to, to to hopefully give the guys in the plant a little um, heads up on on. Um, on damage that's coming in, we've we've seen instances with the with the, on the over the road truck side. Um, you know, making sure you're you're especially if you're using flatbeds, making sure that the beds are in good shape. We've seen um, wrap damage come in from from guys that have a, a damaged bed, and every time they're loading and unloading a module, um, it's being torn by that damaged bed. Of course, I'm sure Legina is going to talk about having the correct chains. Um, on the module trucks, uh, but then, then you move back a step further, and, and like um, um, Jeff mentioned, you know, having this module staged in a place where the the maybe the stubble isn't damaging the modules, or even making sure they're in a straight line. As as these modules get bigger, um, you know, if the, if they're not staged for for conventional module trucks, if they're not set up in straight lines. Um, any the, the more crooked they are, the better chance you've got to um, to tear the sides of the modules when you're when you're loading them in the trucks. Um, and then of course you get all the way back to to picker maintenance, having the right kind of wrap. Um, we've got a new ASABE standard. Of course, it's, it's brand new, so it's it's going to be kind of uh, to be determined how that how that plays out. I mean, how are we going to, um, to make sure that the wrap that we've got out there meets the standard? Um, but I think that's something that we need to keep a close eye on and really pay attention to. Uh, um, when we develop the, uh, the standard, and, and to back up a minute, uh, the, the standard was developed by ASABE, the American Society of Biological and Agricultural Engineers. Um, I think Ed Barnes is on the call. Ed was one of the real drivers of this standard, but it's the same group basically that developed the original module tarp standard when we were having trouble with leakage on module, the conventional module tarps. We developed a standard, which I think in the long run made a big difference um, in the way the whole thing, or the way that in the overall quality of the conventional module tarps. Um, so hopefully uh, this standard will have the same impact and, and we'll start to see um, a more consistent um, quality across different wraps as different wraps are developed. And, and this is gonna just be more and more important as the, um, as the round modules get bigger, um, it puts a lot more stress on those, on those wraps. And, and we know that um, if we can get that wrap all the way from the farm to the uh, into the module feeder uh, onto the module feeder bed without any damage. Um, that's one of the biggest things we can do. Um, we just we have a, a lot less trouble uh, with contamination coming from undamaged wraps than we do um, from having 
contem you know from from having wrap that's damaged somewhere along the way. Um, I think one of the things that we've got to keep a real close eye on this year, uh, well, it's been true in the past, but it's getting more and more important is um, is is the size of the modules as, as the new um, pickers um, are able to make bigger and bigger modules. Um, when you go downstream of that, um, the module trucks are the same size that they were last year, for example. And, and so as these modules get larger and larger, you've just got a lot less clearance inside. We didn't have a lot of clearance to begin with. Um, and we've got less, less clearance now. So um, staying in communication, watching the module sizes, um, making sure that, that what, we, what we're bringing in from the field is something that we can process at the GN is, is going to be, um, I think it's going to be a really critical issue this year and, um, and going forward. And of course, back on the farm, um, you know, getting the operators trained and 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 making sure that they understand the the importance of of um, keeping these modules, the quality preserved on the modules, and and the maintenance on the on the uh, pickers is important. Um, one one thing I would say that I I think are are excellent. Uh, the National Cotton Council has a whole set of videos. Um, on maintenance and, and proper handling of round modules all the way from the picker all the way through the gen there's different segments um if 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 our operators on the module feeders if our operators of the trucks if our operators of the cotton pickers um could be trained a little bit better um i think all the way down the line that that's just gonna that's just gonna pay dividends as as we're going forward um that's really, I think, in in a nutshell, the communication and and just awareness and training are are what you know we're we're focusing on from our standpoint. I think a lot of the uh, technology that's coming out is is something that guys are going to want to take a real hard look at. Um, and um, John and Lauren and and all the speakers you've got coming forward are, will do a a great job of explaining those. So I certainly don't need to get into that. Um, but I, I think just awareness, communication, um, let's, let's, let's just try to knock this thing down a little more every year until we, we finally get the problem solved. Um, and that's, that's all I've got, Bobby. Well, that's good, really good information. And, and once again, uh, thank you for, for taking your time to, uh, come visit with us this morning and and, and like we have trying to, to accomplish the more education and the more thought process that we we can gather in in one spot uh hopefully some some good uh, uh results will will follow so uh with that our uh, next speaker is uh, uh mr ben robles he's the area director of the usda classing office in corpus christi and uh, he's also agreed to, again this year to come bring uh, bring us some results from from the class and office from 2021. So uh, with that, Mr. Ben, are you available? Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I am ready, but uh, just let me set up some slides that I have ready. Okay. To We can see them. You can see them. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. They are in the wrong screen for me, but that's, I still can work it out anyway. Okay. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Corpus Christi Classing Office mostly has uh, classes all the cotton from South Texas and Upper East Texas, meaning every single gin in South Texas, all the way up to Dallas. We have a little more than 50 plus gins that we class. Our first, our first slide mostly shows the US crop and plastic contamination. 
And the bars you can see is basically the total PELS class. But to me, it's more important to concentrate on, on the lines. And this line, purple line, basically tells us the number of samples with plastic. And whenever I say just uh, inform information, whenever I say sample plastic, everybody knows that that means one bell, a bell with plastic, because the sample has the plastic. But on the 19 crop, we had 4,900 samples with plastic. And then on the 20 crop, we had 4,100. But this past year, for in the US, we end up having 62, almost 6,300 samples with plastic or bales with plastic in the US. That's a little more than 50% increase for the country, basically. Now, once we see, that's basically the number of samples. Once we see this based on ratio or the relationship between the samples with plastic and the crop, we can see that on the 19 crop, we had one, we were seeing one sample with plastic every 3,900 samples class. Basically that once we class 3,900 samples approximately in the nation, we, one sample with plastic was showing up. And then on the 2020 crop, it, it went down to one sample every 3,400. And as the number of samples with plastic increases, our ratio starts going down. So now for the nation, we have one sample of plastic every 2,700 samples class. For Corpus Christi, I have data for four crop years, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And again, on 18, we had 1,400 samples with plastic, and then it went up to almost 1,700 samples with plastic. And then on the 2020, we did a great improvement. And I think it's a lot about the dedication of the people here in South Texas, because we went down to 943 samples with plastic for that year. And this past year, 2021, it was 1,020 a slight increase. I do not know if it's significant or not, but um, it's still low compared to the first two years that I have in information. The same way, this is the total number of samples with plastic. If we go in and evaluate the ratio on, on the 2018 crop, we were seeing one sample of plastic every 1200 samples class. And then, on the 19 and went out to one every 1257. And then we improved to one sample every 1800. And this past year, 2021 crop was one sample with plastic every 1700. From the all the class and office basis, we can see that we had, this is the total number of samples with plastic. And we had almost 1600 on, on the 19 crop. And then it went down to 936 and now 1020 for this 2021 crop. But at the same time, you can see that our number of samples is, is slightly going down, but not necessarily it is happening on the other offices. Lubbock had a significant increase as, the, as, as well as other, the other West Texas, like Abilene and La Mesa. Now we go back to the ratio. Obviously the higher the bar on the ratio is what we want to see. And, uh, and we go back to Corpus Christi, our office, we, could almost say that we have remained consistent with those numbers, improving slightly, but we are consistent. But uh, in this past crop, 2021 crop, we were seeing one sample with plastic every 1700 samples class. But uh, if we look at Visalia, they are showing one sample of plastic every 1022. And the other significant ones, it will be Abilene, La Mesa, and Lubbock. 
they all having more plastic and probably more round modules in that area. Florence, I still remember three years ago when we had this presentation that I was very surprised why uh, Florence was showing only one sample of plastic every 16,000 samples. That meant once they were seen in that class in office, a sample with plastic or a bell with plastic, almost every two shifts of operation in the class in lab. Right now, 2021 crop, they went down to one every 8,200. So they are probably seeing one sample of plastic every shift, but it's still better than our situation. But I could almost guarantee that they probably have a lot less ground modules than we do. This is probably our, my most important slide, and I might probably dedicate a little more time on it. As you can see, this is by gins. I have 47 gins in this slide. Actually, we have a little more than 50 plus gins in South Texas. Two or three of the very small gins that had no sample with plastic are not represented here, but they were extremely small and two or three gins from the valley that did not operate at all during the 2020 crop are not here either. But we have information for three years again, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And if you see this red bar, that represents our class in office. And, and for the purple one, it says one sample of plastic every 1,700. This is our class in office. This is a representation for all of us the average of all of the gins in this area. But at the same time, if you look at it, those, what we want, what we're looking for is a bar, the higher, the better at the bar. And we're going to talk about this big one in, in a minute. But the, we, we have several gins that are down here, very low bars. That's gins that are, uh, that are obtaining at least a sample with plastic every several hundred samples, one every 300, one every 500, one every 800. There is a lot of room for improvement in those genes. We do have this gen again, gen number 33, that last year gave us this high bar and it's going to be, if I remember right, we saw one sample of plastic on that gin for the whole cotton season of 2020. Meaning they gin 21, 22,000 samples and had only one sample with plastic. That's why their, their bar is, is that high. Every other one, there are some big gins that, that is average the number of samples of plastic within all of their samples. But at the same time, and again, the numbers to see the number, the, the comparison is on the left-hand side. At the same time, if we see close by, closely, we can see that gen number three, gen number eight, 16, 30, 34, and 44. They did something different. It is significant, the big change that they had, especially like if we see 44, where when they were having one sample of plastic every thousand bales, and now this past crop, they have one sample of plastic every 12,000. Something changed, we don't know what it is. At the same time, we have genes like number four, number five, number six, and 35 and 42, where last year on 2020 crop, they had great results, a lot less plastic contamination than this year. What was the difference? We don't know. Now for the color of plastic, 
2020 crop and 2021 crop. If you see the biggest difference is the blue plastic. We went from 4.3% to 17.8% this past 2021 crop. And um, at the expense of the pink, which was 25 down to 13 and the orange from 5.5 to 1.2. Most of the other ones remain the same. Again, both of them is 2020 crop compared to 2021. In a comparison of us, Corpus Christi with the US is pretty similar the same way. Our blue plastic is a little higher the number, the percent than in the nation. But at the same time in the US, the black plastic is, is uh, uh, big, a huge amount compared to what the amount of black plastic that we have. A lot of you were probably aware that a lot of that black plastic is in our, the Western states of our country where there's a lot of um, black plastic on vegetable fields. And that's the end of my presentation. Now, if you have any questions, I'm um, willing to take some or we wait until the end. in the chat that don't see any questions at the moment that's not saying that some may not come in and and uh, if they do we'll uh, uh, try to get those addressed in a timely timely manner but uh, uh, Mr. Ben we uh, again thank you for being here uh, uh, really good information we got to know where we're coming from where we're going so uh, uh, those numbers and and those uh, graphs sure uh, uh, paint a picture so uh, Greatly appreciate your time and, and effort to, to uh, address this issue. And and uh, again, thank you for being on. Thank you all. And everybody knows where I am. So any questions also, they can find me. Thank you. So again, thank you, Ben. Uh, as we move forward in our, uh, our agenda this morning, uh, we have uh, Laura Krogman. She is the manager and marketing or manager marketing and process technology with the next National Cotton Council. And again, we're grateful for her uh, getting up this morning. And uh, I think you're in a different time zone as well. Uh, so, uh, no, no, we're in the same zone. So, we're good. okay. So, okay. Well, uh, anyway, thank you for coming and uh, uh, being with us and, and giving us a per perspective of. Uh, 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 from the National Cotton Council. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Bobby. And thank you all for having me today. And I look forward to um, speaking with you all. Let me get my slide shared. There we go. Hope everyone can see that okay. All righty. Yes, we can see it good. Thank you very much. So, uh, as Bobby said, I'll go ahead and give everyone an uh, overview of plastic contamination in 2022 and some of the projects that the council has going on and with the industry to combat plastics within cotton. So I wanted to review uh, our packaging material use of the 2021 crop, just to give a perspective of the plastic that we have within the uh, packaging, the bagging and the ties. Um, so on this slide, you can see our tie use trend over the last 21 years. Um, black is the black line is wire ties and the green line is going to be your PET strap. We're currently around 90% PET strap and about 10% wire usage. And we're estimating that we still have about 100 to maybe 150 gins that are still using wire and that'll make up about 30%. Um, it is mainly our smaller gins, and we had a few very big gins that were still using wire, um, but most of those have transferred over to PET strap in the last few years, which accounts for the uh, drastic drop from the last uh, couple years in wire. For our bagging use trend, uh, this is a little bit harder to predict. 
Um, the blue line is going to be the woven polypropylene and the red is PE film. Currently, we're sitting at 61% for polypropylene and 39% for PE film. And over time, you know, this has again been less predictable than bale ties. Um, the two main drivers for bale bag market share appear to be different price uh, differentials between polyethylene and polypropylene resins. Sometimes some are more expensive than others. And then uh, regional bag preferences as well. Um, as of last year, I'm sure uh, y'all are probably already aware, but there are no more uh, GenFast Signode bags in the marketplace. Those have been phased out, um, as you can see by the, the gray PET bag line going down to zero. Uh, JCIBPC, or the Joint Cotton Industry Bail Packaging Committee, approved Pantone 306C as an additional color for woven polypropylene bagging back in 2020. I hope that many of you have seen this uh, blue woven polypropylene bag by now, and I think you'll be seeing a lot more of it in the coming years. Um, this was a response to complaints received by overseas mills explaining that when the bag was cut, uh, sometimes they'd get plastic tapes that can fray coming from this bag and could get into the outside of the cotton bale. Um, this specific Pantone color was designed by the Gin Labs as the easiest color to detect using the camera systems that are now in many mills. In turn, this was a good faith effort to mills overseas to help combat contamination in a cost-effective way that didn't require any significant changes to the gin or the packaging. So just by this addition of color, we've had a lot of good feedback from gins that really appreciate the efforts, and it really makes it a lot easier on their machines to identify this contamination that might get into the system. So here's an example of some of those bags on the left. Um, and I've went ahead and charted out um, since the bags have been approved back in 2020, how many have been placed into the market. Um, so the percentages on the right show the estimated number of polypropylene bags in the market for each year, and then the percentage of that, which was blue. And as you can see for 2022, we're expecting this number to increase significantly. And uh, many of the bagging companies that I've spoken to are actually switching their full production lines over to blue at this point now. Um, just some more examples. We have noticed that it stands out really well. It provides a very good uh, marketing tool as well for our cotton. So uh, it looks very cohesive and it actually provides a really good contrast for a PBI tag as well within the warehouse to make it easier on scanning. So uh, during our 2022 annual meeting uh, for the JCI BPC back in February, the committee approved adding translucent light blue or that same Pantone 306C as an approved color for PE film now as well. Um, we did also remove GenFast bags from just the bagging and tie code tables. Um, so they will still be a fully approved product, but since it's no longer gonna be in use, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that the, the data going into the warehouse receipts is um, as good as possible. And so to clean that up, we're gonna go ahead and take those off since they're no longer um, being used. Um, the PBI tags have also been updated and as well as the guide for cotton bale standards. So if anyone is interested in looking at those, those are on our website. We've had another project that's been ongoing for quite some time now as well, um, working on cotton bagging, which again was a uh, response to plastic contamination and our plastic packaging to see what we can do as a alternative um, in the marketplace to provide something more sustainable and as well as uh, combating that contamination. Um, so in 2020, we began this project. It was a project funded by merchants and the council to determine the market supply chain acceptance of our fully approved three pound cotton bale bag. Um, so this bag has been approved on the bale packaging specification since 1974, but it's never been utilized due to the high cost. Um, so in 2020, we placed 40,000 bags at 11 gins in the Mid-South in the Southwest regions. 
And then we followed those bags all the way from the gin through the warehouse merchant and ultimately to either a domestic or international mill. We collected survey data for every step of the way on um, how these bags were, uh, um, the, the opinion on these bags as well as the durability of these bags throughout each step of the process. Uh, we were really pleasantly surprised by the durability of these bags and how well they held up through our processes. Um, they didn't perform quite as well as a polypropylene bag, but they outperformed our PE film bags. And I have just a real quick video of uh, Jen putting these on. This doesn't have sound. Um, unfortunately, at this point, we're only able to place these on manual baggers. Um, it is possible to use them on automatic baggers. They do it in Australia, um, but their bag is a little lighter weight and this one's a little heavier. And so it would need a retrofit at the gin in order to get this to work. Um, so we're not quite at that stage yet, but we are gonna be moving on to um, a, a second phase of this project, if you will. Um, so for 2022, we, wanted to do a comparison of some different bag weights. So we have this approved three pound bag and we got a 1.9 pound as well as a two and a half pound developmental bag that's processed and manufactured in the exact same way that three pound is, just a little bit lighter. Um, we're hoping that through this test, we can figure out a more cost-effective option uh, to the three pound bag to, to maybe make this cotton bag um, something more realistic that a, a regular gen can, can put on. Um, so we began to develop plans for this. Uh, we do plan to place a small number of each of uh, the three different types or sizes of bags into three different regions. And they'll be tested over a span of nine months in a warehouse and moved around on a monthly basis so that we can determine um, durability and fully track the performance of each of the weights of these different bags. One of our main issues um, during the first project was PBI tag adhesion and um, the adhesive used on our PBI tags just are not meant to stick on a cotton bag, they're meant for plastic. And so we were having a lot of issues with PBI tags coming off and so in addressing that, we've developed a stronger adhesive for a new tag, and we'll be testing that alongside um, these different weights to determine uh, durability of that as well. Um, hopefully, this will provide enough data to perform a full cost analysis on each weight of bagging and ultimately be able to determine if cotton bagging is a viable option. We did run into a few production quality issues this last year with some bale packaging causing contamination. And so I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of these and um, to, to make sure that we're all in communication and to address things like this as quickly as possible so that we can fix them. Um, so one of our main problems that we saw this year was some woven polypropylene contamination. Um, in the past, we'd hear from overseas mills that would comment on the polypropylene bags that when they were cut, they caused contamination uh, due to the fraying of the bag, but we were never able to actually get any physical samples or proof. And it came uh, from the glassing office actually from Ben last year um, that we were starting to see blue in there now that we changed the woven polypropylene bagging color. Um, this is unfortunate, but it was also um, a, good, a good thing just so that we were aware so that we can start pushing out education efforts and make sure that this is addressed. Um, so we, we have a few test bags up here in the office and we, me and Harrison actually went up there with a, a dull knife and tried cutting some of these. And, and this is what we got. And um, this is frankly unacceptable per the, the specifications. And so we found out that certain bags didn't have enough coating on them. And um, this came down to a quality control issue, but ultimately it can affect the mill. And so we did receive a report last summer from a domestic mill that received a claim due to blue woven polypropylene fiber in the yarn. Um, and again, I just wanna stress that, you know, this is a major issue, but we want to make sure that we're keeping our woven polypropylene 
as reliable as possible. Um, knowing China's rule on uh, either cotton bags, polyethylene film, or plastics that do not contaminate, um, we don't want to be lumped into that group of plastics that contaminate and risk losing our um, market share to China for bales that are wrapped in woven polypropylene. So staying on top of things like this is, is very important. Um, following these reports, I did meet with all of the approved uh, polypropylene bagging manufacturers back in October and uh, made sure that they were aware of the reports that came in and showed them all of the pictures that came with them as well and determined that it was a coating issue for those bags. Um, the coating was just not as thick as it needed to be. And so it was a quality control issue, not a specifications issue. Um, so we haven't heard of any more serious problems with this. Um, they were quick to resolve this, um, but just again, keep, keep an eye out on things. And if you do run into any problems, either getting in touch with your bagging manufacturer or us at the council and we can um, you know, get the ball rolling on getting things fixed as quickly as possible. Um, we also had some PET strap wax issues this last year uh, in the Mid-South region for the most part, um, but this PET strap was compromised because the wax coating on the outside of the strap wasn't applied correctly um, for a couple of pallets of this product. Um, so without the wax, the strap is unable to perform a solid weld and instead ends up etching grooves into the plastic, as you can see above. Um, the gins that received the bad batch of strapping ended up having to apply sponges with mop and glow on the strap before it went into the strapping system in order to apply the needed wax coating. Um, again, we were contacted by the gins pretty quickly once we started seeing this. In working with the strapping manufacturer, we were able to uh, replace all of that bad strap at the gyms in the Mid-South and um, put it in, put in new um, correct strap and, and this problem went away pretty quickly. So I, I do have to hand it to those manufacturers to, to get that replaced as quickly as they did. Um, due to these various issues that we've had over the last crop year, the JCIBPC has instructed staff to begin random sample testing for all woven polypropylene and PET strap companies. Um, so we're in the process of collecting samples now to be sent out to our third party lab. Uh, I would like to talk just a little bit about the new ASABE round module wrap standard, but I don't want to steal too much of John's thunder, so I'll leave most of it, the details to him. Um, but just to give you all a background on, on the policy side of things and how the council kind of played a role, um, we did have new policy that was added to Research and Education Committee during the 2021 uh, NCC annual meeting. And the policy supported the efforts of ASABE in the development of this round module wrap standard, which addressed key properties such as tensile strength, abrasion resistance, puncture resistance, adhesive properties, and colors that can be best detected. And then on February 15th of this year, the ASABE did fully approve that new round module wrap standard. Uh, it serves as a voluntary standard for the industry to protect against inferior products that can cause contamination and other issues. Um, the standard was developed using the TAMA premium wrap, so the pink and the yellow, which performs at an acceptable level. And it also includes a field trial requirement over an extended period of time um, that the company must meet in different climate conditions. And uh, they have to either meet that or exceed it before they're going to become approved. Um, so moving forward, NCC is the depositor, depository for the names of manufacturers who meet this minimum standard. Um, we have it on our website under contamination free cotton, and there's going to be a listing there as well as all of the guidelines for this and a copy of the full ASABE standard um, that's been provided. We also uh, opened up a new email address for anyone that has any questions or companies to go ahead and put in requests at wrapstandard at cotton.org. Currently, there's no one on the approved list, but I know we have a couple of companies right now that are in the process of getting their samples off to third party labs. 
um, for that analysis. And then um, following that, they'll go into the field trial stage. So just some reminders on plastic contamination. Um, we have seen reduced reports of PET strap contamination this year, but just uh, wanted to remind everyone to please keep a check on your machine calibrations regularly. And again, work, working closely with your strapping suppliers if any problems do come up, just keeping that communication open. Um, and then rotating uh, your stock of strap is very important as well. It does have a little bit of a shelf life and you shouldn't be using strap that's over two seasons old. Um, we did have two reports submitted to the council this year through our contamination survey, which comes from either domestic or international mills. Um, we had some oil uh, reports as well as yellow, pink, uh, round module wrap. The reports that we received have been down for this year compared to past years, which is wonderful. Um, we're really hoping that this trend continues as uh, mills start taking in 2021 cotton. But again, these are just some, some photo examples of some things that we've seen, some things to look out for and keep an eye on uh, to prevent plastic contamination. And this is just a um, blurb for the video that um, Kelly was talking about as well. Um, this is our plastic prevention or prevention of plastic contamination for round module wrap video, which is available on our website as well as on our YouTube page. But essentially it's a chaptered video for each operation um, between picking in the field all the way to unwrapping at the gin and just shows best management practices, uh, best machine calibrations. If you run into certain problems and this is what you're getting, you know these are the things to check. Um, so this is a really valuable tool, especially if you have uh, producer meetings or Jenner meetings in terms of uh, education efforts, sitting down and showing folks this uh, could, could be a big help. Um, most of these chapters are between two and five minutes long, so it's not as um, as large as it seems. Um, so it should be fairly quick, uh, but it is a great reminder to just uh, stay vigilant and make sure that uh, plastic is not getting into the system. And thank you all very much for having me today. And if anyone uh, has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you, Lauren. Uh Great information. A lot of a lot of things that uh, maybe we don't actually think about, but uh, you bringing bringing those forward is, is great help. I, I've got a question, and don't mean to put you on the spot, but with your videos, have y'all do y'all keep track of downloads and how many times they're viewed and that sort of thing? And is there a trend at various times of the year that y'all have an influx of of uh, views? Bobby, I got to be honest, we really tracked it hard that first year that we put it out. Um, and we did see a lot of views, um, of course, whenever it first released, but then at the beginning of that season. Um, I have not looked at it in a while, though, um, but we were ranking in like about 3000 views for the English version. And I think just shy of about 1000 for the Spanish version um, back in 2020 or so. But I can take a look at that and kind of give you an idea and get back to you on that. Oh, greatly appreciate it. Just, just kind of uh, curious that uh, yeah. uh, those being available and how often they're being used. Great question. So I don't see any any other questions in the chat. Uh, we are scheduled for a, a ten minute break here. Uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, which uh, doesn't bother me at all. That. You know, I think uh, quick and fast information has a tendency to stick more, so uh, that's all good. But uh, we will, uh, it's 9.54, uh, 55. Uh, let's start back at uh, 10.05. Uh, yeah, 10.05, if everybody wants to take a break, we'll, we'll uh, shut down for 10 minutes and start back at uh, uh, 10.05.
Okay, uh, my computer just uh, said 10.05, so uh, we will uh, continue on with our, our program this morning. Uh, in, in trying to uh, plan this, this, uh, this seminar, uh, uh, Mr. Kent Fountain's name come up and uh, he has agreed to come on and, and visit with us this morning. Uh, uh, Kent Fountain is the president CEO of Southeastern Gin and Peanut in Surrency, uh, Georgia. Uh, he's also been past uh, chairman of the National Cotton Council. So uh, uh, he brings brings a, a lot to us this morning and we're very thankful and grateful that uh, he's taken out of his day and time to, to come and, and talk to us about uh, some of the things that have uh, been implemented around uh, the oper operation that he oversees. So uh, with that said, good morning, Mr. Fountain, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Bobby, and, and thank you for allowing me to be on this. And, and just let me tell you, this is awesome what you all are doing to, uh, to make and to keep uh, awareness, as Kelly said, uh, of plastic contamination. You know, I think that's one of the key things we've got to do, and I think we've done a good job and we've got to continue. And I applaud you all for doing it uh, and having these, uh, these webinars to uh, just keep it at the forefront. Uh, as Bobby said, I, I'm been in the cotton business for uh, this will be my 28th season coming up and uh, so I've seen a lot as most of you all on here have and uh, and I guess I've been dealing with plastic since 2009 and it's uh, it's an issue that is uh, very near and dear to my heart that that, that we've got to uh, I feel like we we're making strides but we've got to do better as an industry and we've got to uh, we've got to figure out how to uh, to handle this so that we do not uh, impede our marketing ability of U.S. cotton, uh, and we can be the best, as I think we are the best growth in the world. Uh, I'm going to give you just some personal views. Uh, Kelly's talked a lot about some of the stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it's not earth shattering, what, uh, but it's just keeping it on the forefront and, and making sure people understand, uh, you know, that plastic is really a, an issue and, and getting uh, our growers, you know, and it starts as, as Kelly, it starts with the growers, but it's not, I think Kelly has said this, it's not a grower, Jenner, it, it's a total industry issue and it follows from the field to the, uh, the yarn mill actually. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a whole industry issue that we've got to figure out. And uh, I think we're making strides. Um, we've got uh, John and Ed on here. They've done, done great work and, and you'll hear some of that, but uh, we just got to continue, but it starts in the field. It starts with the grower. It starts with the grower, as, as Kelly said, you know, trying to figure out, uh, uh, you know, where to put the modules. Jeff was talking about that. Don't try not to put them in the stalks. Try not to let them, the, the stalk pierce the uh, wrap, which causes a, a place that can tear. Um, the, the maintenance of the machinery. You know, it's just all inclusive of, of getting your growers to understand the, the, how, how important this is to our industry as a whole. And once they do, uh, you know, I, I see it at my gym. Once they do, they start, uh, they start calling when they have a, wrap, a, a torn module that may be a problem, uh, or double wrap module, a Tootsie Roll module. They start calling and letting you know. Uh, I'll tell you that when I have problems with modules or or, or see contamination within the module, I call the grower and say, look, you know, this is, this, we saw a piece of your uh, rack from somewhere inside the module and just to let him know so he can be, uh, be apprised to it and a little more mindful of it. So uh, grower education is huge. I think the council's done a great job. Lauren talked about the, the website and the, and, and the, the issues that, and the, the things that we can, the tools we have that you can go and find and, and, uh, and I encourage, uh, we have a little meeting every year, a pre-harvest meeting where we get, try to get growers to come to and we actually show them some of the videos and, and talk about it firsthand uh, and, uh, and before the, the season starts. So it's my, you know, it, it's fresh on people's mind every start of the season. We talked about the uh, wrap standards. You know, I can't emphasize enough. We need to make sure our growers understand there is a standard and that we need to be buying this wrap. Uh, if possible, that meets the standard. Uh, it's, uh, I've said this in the past, I've had a lot of meetings with Tama, a lot of meetings with, with John Deere. Uh, you know, the economy wrap came out, Tama came out with an economy wrap and my 
comment to them, we don't need to have a race to the bottom. I understand markets and I understand what they're trying to do, but uh, that's one of the reasons we came out with a standard. We, we, we've got a good wrap. The wrap, the time of the yellow wrap that has been improved upon over the, the past 10, 12 years is, is, a, is a good wrap and we just don't need to go backwards. And so encourage your growers to, uh, to, to buy a wrap that, uh, that meets the standard. And that's why we came up with it. Um, the module truck that was talked about by Kelly, it is a, a very concerning issue as we get larger diameter modules. I would say, of course, have the right chains. Uh, and then also on the, on the back of the module trucks, I know that uh, uh, Regina's on here. I, you know, I have Stover module trucks and, and there's a retrofit kit that has rollers that will help then uh, when they come, you get close to the side that it won't maybe pierce it. Uh, but I'll tell you that, that what I'm doing at, on the yard, most of mine are coming in on flatbeds. And I, I, luckily I think, because I think we module trucks can cause issues with, with, with round modules, but I have to take them from my yard where I unload them to the gen on a flatbed. So we're cutting the sides down this year. So, so that, 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 that I can't touch the, the, uh, the, outside of the module as they get bigger uh, because you know you're getting seasonal help uh, that maybe it's not the same guy that ran the truck last year and uh, and so we're just take trying to take that part out of the equation of us messing it up from the time it hits our yard until it gets to the gin. Um, the chains we have the right chains but I will tell you that the chains on module trucks in my opinion do not have enough surface area we pierce the module, it doesn't, and I'm not talking about when you have to run it up too far, if a driver runs it up too far, I find them on my yard. When I let, I, I use a, a loader, a stover with an attachment uh, to a uh, front end loader. So I unload them at the gym by the module truck and I see it in little pieces uh, about an inch by half inch. And it's exactly the chain, the, the round bar on the chain where it pierces them. You know, that's, <laughs> That's a big issue in my opinion, because if I'm unloading directly onto the module feeder, uh, I, I don't catch that. I can't catch that. Uh, in Australia, they use moon buggies, as most of you all probably know. They have a bigger chain. It's a bigger machine, but it's a bigger chain, and it allows them to put a, like a half by one, one uh, flat bar, which is about four inches long, so you get a bit more surface area. And so uh, I want to do some some testing and seeing if there's, if there's a way we could go that way. But, but I just encourage you to, you know, to tell your generals and to, to look at that because it does, I've, I've seen it multiple times and every year. So it, it does happen. Uh, I think it's the best we have right now, but it does happen. As I said before, I, I, most of mine come in, probably 99% come in on flatbeds. Uh, I learned the hard way. You need the same person unloading at the gym, in my opinion year in and year out. So I take a full-time employee and they unload the modules off the flatbed. And it has drastically changed us messing up modules that come into us. Uh, the biggest threat is, as uh, was said earlier by Kelly, is, is a busted module or a torn module. And, uh, and so if we can do whatever we can do to keep that from happening, and, and for me, it's been using the same person on that uh, front end loader to unload those modules. And I encourage my growers to use the same person to load those modules uh, because it's the same principle. And, and, and we've gone way down in, in, in instances of torn modules that's getting loaded because the growers have, have, have started doing that. So, uh, uh, you know, I would just encourage that. It, it, it's, it's, it, everybody thinks, it, it, most of you at gen level know, everybody thinks they can run it run all the pieces of equipment, but uh, it takes uh, someone with a little bit of experience to uh, unload round modules and to not tear them. And again, the same thing with flatbeds, Kelly mentioned, I think, uh, you know, your flatbeds need to have good good, good timber on them. They don't need to have uh, splintered and, and things of that nature uh, just to keep them uh, from getting torn. So if we can get them to the gen and not get them torn and not have to worry about busted modules, then we, we're, I'd say 90%, uh, winning the battle, but I don't think that. But we still have issues at the gym, and ever how you unwrap, there's always issues to uh, that you're going to get either small pieces, you're going to get a tail, uh, whatever you you know. There's something in the module, so uh, 
I just encourage any way you unwrap to make sure you've got several set of eyes watching the module feeder as they uh, unwrap it. Uh, just to, to catch it, if we can catch it before it gets to the dispersing cylinders, um, you know, it's, you're ahead of the game. We dig them out. It, it, you know, we stop the product or, you know, stop the module feeder. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it means you have to stop production. But it's worth it to uh, to do that so that you don't get it into the uh, to the feeder and, and throughout the gen. We've already, uh, I think Kelly talked about, uh, you know, the, the cameras, we started out testing some cameras at the foundation scent. And then we went with just at my gym, we use a Nest camera any, or an internet type camera. It's cheap. Um, it looks at the dispersing cylinders. Um, we have a, cam, a, a TV, a 50 inch TV or so that is dedicated just to that camera. Uh, we have a feed control. So our module feeder does stop. So it allows uh, allows you to see those, those dispersing cylinders. Uh, you know, and then you have to educate your generators that you have to stop. You know, when you see it, you have to stop. And I think that's another part of our culture that we've, we've had to change because we're so production oriented as generators. And we have to be, and we have to make, be efficient to be able to, to gen this cotton and, and, and the, you know, with the chargeable charging. But, but we've also got to understand that this is a, such an important issue that you've got to stop. Uh, you've got to stop, you've got to clean it out. You got to find it, and then you got to start back ginning. So, uh, the cameras are, in my opinion, the, the cheapest level of first defense that we can do. Uh, every gen, in my opinion, ought to have them. Uh, you can do it for five hundred dollars or less, in my opinion, and uh, it's just worth worth doing it. And it's something we need to do uh, as an industry. And I think we have had had widespread uh, uh, adoption of that. Um, the Viper system. So I'm, uh, I guess, the only one that has a Viper system that the USDA came up with. And, you know, uh, John and Ed on this call, they work tireless, tirelessly on this. USDA has worked on all these projects. There's several things out there that uh, that, that are going to come to the gen level, hopefully, in the next few years. If anybody's ever heard me speak, I think the only way we take care of this issue is having machinery in the gen that is the detection and removal system. Uh, I, I bought the Viper system. Uh, uh, Loomis uh, is marketing it. Uh, I'll tell you, it works. Uh, it makes you, it's a humbling experience to sit there and think you're doing a good job. You're not getting plastic calls at the, at the uh, classing office level. I had only gotten one call in all these years. And uh, the first year we used, two years ago when I bought the Viper system, we got it up and running. I got five one-gallon bags full of the plastic. And so, you know, it, it's not getting caught at the classing office because we're taking one-pound sample out of a 500-pound bale. Uh, it's not that they're not finding it. It's just that it's just such a, a small chance to be able to do it. So it's, uh, it works. Um, I will say that, that I need to... We're all to encourage Loomis to uh, to continue with it. We're not getting the support we should, in my opinion, and, and I'm having conversations with them. Uh, we've got to have a system like this. We've got to go to blue wrap, in my opinion, for systems like this. Um, we've got to get gens willing to buy these systems, whatever system comes online, to be able to spend the money to do it because uh, we're in a catch-22 if we wait until – there is a uh, financial impact to that gen. We've waited too long, in my opinion. When that happens, we've lost our marketability of cotton because that means it's gotten so bad that, uh, that the, 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 the mer merchandising industry and cooperative industry are going after gens to recoup their, uh, their losses. So I encourage everyone on this call and, and growers to, to go to your gen and, and, and say, look, when, when things become commercially available, you need to look at them. We want you to look at them uh, as a service provider for us because I firmly believe the only way we take care of this problem totally is to get machinery in the gen and uh, that, that can detect it and remove it. And then, you know, I think you bring it down to maybe 99%. I'll just tell you the Viper was pretty much about 90% on testing. 95, almost 100% on blue. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of blue. It can take away, as people that know about this system, 
it's just a camera system, but the yellow is in the same scope as a yellow cotton. It's the same scope as, as, uh, as bark, uh, different things. And so it gives you some burrs, it gives you some false positives. And so you have to go in there and tweak it. Well, with blue, you don't, it's not in that spec. So you don't get the false positives and you don't have to tweak it and, and all this as much. So uh, it does work. It's, it's kind of proved my opinion because it throws it on the floor, but hey, that, that's fine. I can go through it and, uh, and put it back in the overflow and, and it's fine. But uh, I think there'll be, and I, I hope and pray there will be some more systems that are a little more advanced in that, that, that maybe they detect it and throw it into another system. Uh, and, and then that system takes it out and it puts it back in the flow of cotton. Uh, you know, that that's the best world we can get to at some time. And I think we will at some time. And uh, at that time, or even before with even the Viper system, we just need to, uh, we need to embrace these systems as an industry, ginning industry, and, uh, and bite the bullet uh, and buy them and use them so that we can, uh, we can take care of this problem 100%, in my opinion. Um, and like I said, the USDA is working hard on several different things. Um, and it's just taking some time, but uh, at some point, I think a lot of these won't break, and there'll be a lot of and, and uh, of different ideas or different in, different pieces that we can buy or, or equipment we can buy, and that's what we need. We need to have some choices out there uh, to be able to, as a generous to be able to buy what we think is best for our our particular gen. So uh, I just encourage you that, and I encourage you as generous to uh, to go to the blue uh, bail wrap. Uh, because I think as we go that route and, and encourage Tama, encourage your John Deere, you producers, encourage them to to go to a blue cover and get it. They're already making a blue cover, and it's just in the economy wrap, <laughs> which we needed in the the other the yellow wrap. needs to turn blue so that uh, because it's, it's it's up to our standards, so uh, it can be done. It can, and, and it's not a price point, so we just need to get them to move towards that to uh, help us and, and also help the mills and that, that, that they can see it better also. And then uh, Lauren uh, touched on it, but I, I, I'll just have to end by saying that another concern I, I'm seeing more and more of and, and is the uh, plastic strap fibrils, they call them, the little fuzzies that, uh, that, that on our plastic strap. Let's just make sure that our, our uh, machines are uh, calibrated and we aren't creating these small fibrils uh, that are right on outside of the uh, of the bell that, that can uh, cause contamination also. So with that, Bobby, uh, I'll take any questions or any comments. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, I'm just applaud you all for doing this and, uh, and I'm going to encourage uh, the Southeast for us to do it. I'm, all dusty because it's a great platform and you're you're keeping it aware and keeping it on the forefront and, uh, and I applaud y'all for doing it. I'm going to have to get out in just a minute. Uh, I'm at my son's graduating from college and uh, so I'm going to have to get off but uh, but I do have time for any questions if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Fountain and uh, uh, again uh, appreciate you being on, taking your time, uh, especially uh, that your graduate son's graduation. That's pretty. Uh, that's that's one more of those bricks that gets uh, taken off your shoulders. So uh, 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 just uh, glad for you in that uh, respect. Also, we do have one question here. Uh, just to ask Quinn, and how do you gin broken rounds? Uh, well, I gin them, I gin broken rounds. I, I still have a suck lane just because of that. Uh, I would not, I'd have been taking my suck lane out and, and done some different things, but I, I, that's how I do it. That's the only way I know that you can do it and often try not to suck up plastic. What we do is we take about everybody in the gin uh, and, and they watch and, uh, and we suck it up and naturally it slows production down. Um, it's just, it's, part of how we do it. It's the only way we, I know how to do it. I, I've got uh, friends and colleagues in the industry that are I'm very close to that don't have a suck lane and, and, and I've had the conversation with them. I just don't see how you, I don't see how you, you gin a busted round module that is really messed up and with just putting on the module feeder without call, knowing that you're going to contaminate that. 
pure and simple. That's, I just don't know how you do it. And so that's, that's how we do it. It's not very efficient, uh, but that's, that's how we do it. I, have you adopted any practices to repair any of these partially tore or uh, semi-compromised bales? Not to repair them. If we get one that, that the grower calls and says, like I said, we're, we're mainly flatbed. So I've got my growers uh, and they've done a great job of, of calling when they get one that they think they can't load. Uh, so it's got a, little, a tear that's a third the way or whatever. Or, or, or another example is it, it only wrapped part of the wrap. So it's not a full, you know, it's wrapped, but, it's, but it doesn't have all three layers for some reason. And uh, so they, don't, they think it might bust. So we'll go get it with the module truck. And then if it is not uh, busted the whole way, and as I said before, I use I, I, I use the, uh, the, the unloader on the, on the front end loader. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why I do that. I, that's not as most efficient of either, but I've got, when I'm, when I'm cutting that wrap, I've got six eyes looking at it. I, I just am not sold on one person, one set of eyes unwrapping the module with any unwrapping. And that's not a cut on any unwrapping system. I just hadn't got comfortable yet personally with, uh, with one set of eyes looking and knowing they can't see the other side when that wrap's turning or whatever, ever how you unwrap it. But so uh, what we'll do is that, that attachment allows you to pick up a module that is not in the best state. And so then we'll we'll go get it with the module truck, bring it right to the gen, and then we'll sit it on the yard. And then when we get a break and grower, we'll run that module and uh, and all is how we handle it now. But but as far as repairing it, no, we we I I, I don't know of a way to repair them, you know, really. So. I don't see any any more uh, chat questions. So uh, again, we do greatly appreciate you coming on and being a part of our uh, our seminar this morning. And uh, uh, have a have a great day. And and uh, again, congratulations. Well, thank you. And and, and again, I'm, I and I mean this. Thank you all for doing what you're doing. It's. Uh, it's, it's, we need to be doing this in every region and uh, and keeping it on the forefront. So I applaud you and, and kudos to you all. Thank you, sir. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. So as we uh, continue on here, uh, again, we're a little ahead of schedule, which is is, is fine. But uh, uh, we have uh, uh, John Wanyura. He's uh, with USDA RAR. ARS Cotton Production and Processing Research Unit. Uh, we've had we, he was on with us last year and uh, uh, had some good information for us as well. So, uh, John, are you you there? Yes, sir. Okay. I appreciate it. I'm gonna forego my video if that's okay. I'm having some internet connectivity issues, and that's to good. make sure that my presentation goes across all right, I'm gonna uh, keep my face off the off the internet for you that that's fine and dandy i need to uh i'm not able to share my screen at this moment apologies um you must have left the meeting or something like that but you have permission now thank you All right. Are you seeing that all right? Yes, sir. See it good. Okay. <clears throat> so good morning. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here with you and give you an update on uh, some of the research that we've been doing at the, the Lubbock Gen Lab. I think in the past I've uh, focused some on the uh, research that's being done at the other uh, two Gen Labs, also at uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico and Stoneville. And work is continuing at both of those labs on this front. But 
the work that we're going to discuss this morning is really an update on, on what's being done uh, primarily here at the Lubbock Lab uh, in com combination and cooperation with those other labs. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge my uh, co-authors or, or uh, cohorts in, in, uh, in uh, this work. Uh, Dr. Matthew Pelletier uh, and Dr. Greg Holt have, have, are, are both uh, significantly involved with this work, um, as well as uh, the financial support and uh, everything from Cotton Incorporated and National Cotton Council uh, is certainly greatly appreciated. So we're going to talk about several things. As I mentioned here this morning, we're going to talk about first the uh, module wrap standard. Uh, just to bring to the, the forefront of everyone's mind again, <clears throat> a lot of the reason why this uh, research uh, started out and, and is ongoing is uh, due to the uptick in the plastic contamination calls and, and especially with regard to uh, the increase in contamination for those plastic materials that we see that are of the same color of the uh, module wrap materials that are being used on the onboard moduling uh, pickers and strippers. Uh, and so not to belabor that point, but that's, that's uh, you know, one of the main, main drivers behind what we're doing. So this module wrap performance standard that's been uh, discussed to some degree already this morning uh, has been developed really uh, because we've got a couple of issues going on. TAMA has some patents that are set to expire uh, in the next two years that cover uh, the technology and the manufacturing of the, that wrap material. Uh, and as those patents expire, uh, there's a significant concern on the part of the industry that newer, uh, lower uh, cost wrap materials uh, may flood the market um, that don't have the same level of performance that that uh, premium wrap material uh, from TAMA currently has. Um, so our objective was really to develop a standard uh, that specifies that minimum performance level for that wrap material, both as a base material um, and as an applied system on the, on the module. Um, again, uh, this is a voluntary standard uh, uh, through ASABE, American Society of Ag and Biological Engineers, uh, and it's sponsored uh, through that organization by the Cotton Engineering Committee. Uh, this committee is the one that put forth the original uh, module tarp material uh, standard. Uh, and this uh, wrap performance standard is actually a, a modification or an update to that existing standard. It's just an easier process to go in and, and update a standard rather than start from the ground level uh, and develop a new one. So we had our foot in the door, and so we're going to keep swinging that door open with this one. So as of today, uh, the standard is in effect. Uh, we've done a lot of testing, a lot of work, uh, a lot of drafting and back and forth discussions on what needs to be in that standard, how it needs to be put forward. And it was voted upon and approved earlier this year and it put into effect uh, back in February. So this standard, uh, a draft of the standard is actually available on the website that Lauren provided earlier. And um, as well as additional information uh, regarding the uh, process to get a, a wrap material approved. So what's in this standard? Uh, to flesh it out a little bit more, um, this is basically a one level certification. Basically it, you're, a wrap product either meets it or it doesn't. Okay, there was discussion whether or not we needed multiple levels of the standard, uh, a recommended or a, a basically a, a baseline approval uh, and then a recommended level or a superior level, something like that. But in, in the end, we basically set up just a baseline uh, uh, standard that, that says either a wrap material is, is uh, meets approval of the industry or it doesn't. So we based all of these uh, levels on testing that was conducted on the yellow and the pink uh, Tama wrap premium product. So that's the, the multi-layer uh, uh, pink and yellow wrap that you see out there in the field that has the tacky layer uh, adhesive. Um, there are three requirements within the standard uh, for a manufacturer that's interested in uh, meeting certification. There, there's a laboratory testing phase where you, you do basic uh, material strength testing, uh, abrasion testing on, uh, or excuse me, impact and, and uh, tear resistance uh, testing on that material so that you know that that base film material is, is strong enough to handle the the rigors of, of the, the loads that it's going to experience in the field. There's a field testing portion that Lauren mentioned earlier where we, we require that a set of modules or a set of 24 minimum modules be wrapped and, and 
exposed to field storage conditions uh, over a six month period where they're, they're evaluated on several different criteria. And then finally, the wrap color is, is of specific interest to us as well in this, this standard. Uh, we have a, 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 an allowable set of colors basically that says you can use any color except these specific colors. Uh, and then there's also a single recommended color that's that blue color that Kent alluded to earlier, the Pantone 306C uh, that's also been adopted as the, uh, the new bail bagging material standard color. So the laboratory testing uh, that we conducted, we did five rounds of, of testing, looking again at this Tama premium wrap material in a multi-layer uh, testing configuration. So we were looking at the three-layer combination that was made up of the tacky on non-tacky on non-tacky three-layering com three-layer combination. Okay, so all of this testing was done looking at those three layers together. We had samples from five different rolls of, of material spanning in production date from 2017 through 2020 and looking at both the pink and the yellow and the Arctic and standard configurations. The Arctic and standard configuration didn't really play into the testing that was done in the lab as much as it would uh, in the field because that's primarily uh, re related to the adhesive uh, and the performance of that adhesive that's used on the, 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 the tail of, of the module. So this slide shows a, a fairly busy uh, table uh, that shows the, the threshold values that are, that are in place now for the five different uh, characteristics that we test for. Um, the, the takeaway message here is, is two. First of all, for several of these different characteristic tests that we do, um, they are non-isotropic, meaning that they have to be done in, in two different directions on that uh, material sample. Okay, so you would cut samples that would be tested uh, in re relation to the module circumference, uh, then also those tests need to be repeated for the module axis direction. So basically, if you think about uh, the circumference of this slide shows the module circumference direction and, as well as the module axis direction. So those are the two directions of, of testing. The second is this group and single threshold values that are included here. The group would be basically considered like the grand mean of all, you know, of, of all your samples that you submit to this lab, that's the value that that, um, that grand mean has to meet or, or exceed in order to, to pass the standard. The single threshold is put in place there to address the issue of uh, uh, inherent variability in the material that's being tested. And so a single wrap sample cannot have an average that is less than the single value uh, in order to meet the standard. So basically the material has to meet the group and the single thresholds in order to, to pass the laboratory testing portion. In field testing, uh, we're looking at evaluating the performance that wrap on the module uh, in the intended use environment that it's going to be used in. So if it's gonna be used in a cold environment, you know, similar to what the Arctic wrap from Tama would be used in or the standard wrap, which is more intended for use in a, in a more moderate uh, temperature environment. Um, this is looking at the, the wrap system performance. Uh, how well does that uh, wrap stay on the module? Do you have separations in, in uh, the tail adhesive? Uh, do you have breaks in the cover material caused by fatigue or any other factors? Uh, does the adhesive tend to slip as you see in this uh, left-hand uh, photo here where the, the tail material or the tail end starts to slip up because the adhesive has given way uh, and allowed that material to slip up. Um, are there total cover system failures, which would be something like this uh, middle photo is showing where you have an exposure of, the, of any of the cotton around the circumference of the module. Uh, and then also we look at this module squat ratio, which is a way to protect the, uh, the, the shape of that module and, and make sure that uh, the currently uh, the current normal size modules being about 94 inches uh, in terms of the set point diameter coming off of the harvester, that they don't squat too much, that they can't be loaded onto a conventional module truck. Now, as we go, go forward in time, uh, this module squat ratio, we may have to take a look at that as, as the modules get bigger uh, as they come off the harvester. But for now, uh, we do specify that that squat ratio be no more than uh, 1.07. Color, as I mentioned, uh, the allowable colors are basically any color uh, except for clear, white, tan, brown, or black. Those are just basically the colors we want to stay away from because they're, they're very hard to detect in flowing seed cotton. 
The recommended color, as I mentioned, is this Pantone 306C color uh, that's very easily, easily detected uh, by our color imager uh, based uh, detection systems that are being used in the gins uh, and at the mills. So how does all this work? So a wrap manufacturer uh, that wants to have a, a material uh, certified under, under the standard uh, would be responsible for covering all of the, the laboratory testing costs as well as conducting uh, the field testing. So they would basically uh, download the standard, uh, review it, uh, determine, you know, learn how to collect the samples from the standard, uh, and then submit those samples to a third party lab for uh, the testing. Uh, once that testing is complete, the lab is then to send those standard, uh, those, those results uh, to the National Cotton Council um, directly to the National Cotton Council. They're supposed to be submitted from the lab to the, to the council rather than coming from the manufacturer. Uh, and, and then they are also required to conduct the field testing and submit those results to the National Cotton Council. Once all the data is available, uh, uh, the staff there at the National Cotton Council will review the data uh, and then determine whether or not that uh, material and, and that product meets the, uh, the approval uh, with the standard and then places their uh, them on, on the approved list. Um, as I mentioned, this is still a voluntary standard. It doesn't carry uh, the same legal requirements uh, in terms of loan eligibility as the Joint Cotton Industry Bail Packaging Committee uh, process for bail bagging material. Um, but there are uh, conversations being held, I, I guess, uh, considerations being made to uh, perhaps one day tying it to loan eligibility uh, if this uh, this issue, uh, you know, with contamination continues to grow and, and get, gets larger. Uh, so those are some things that are being considered for the future. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge that this has been a huge uh, undertaking uh, by the industry. Uh, Cotton Incorporated has carried a, a big portion of the burden uh, in terms of material testing costs that we did uh, for, uh, for the standard. Uh, there's been a lot of folks at Cotton Incorporated involved with the, the development of, of the standard, drafting of it, um, and then certainly the, the standard development committee within ASABE uh, was a, a multi-university, multi-organization um, group that was put together, you know, from, from universities as well as John Deere and TAMA uh, were, were involved with this um, and helped to provide a lot of technical expertise in how this thing should be put together. So. This is, uh, this is where we are today, um, and, and we think this is a, a good, uh, good point to be in, in terms of moving forward and hope this is something that will be beneficial as we go forward in, in helping to address uh, the, the issues with wrap performance uh, before it's ever put on to a module. So, so moving on to some of the, the latest technologies uh, that we've been working on at the Gen Lab. So we've, we've developed a system, uh, we call this the Integrated Module Feeder Inspection System that helps a gen identify uh, when they have issues uh, or potential contamination events identified on the dispersing cylinders, uh, and then be able to go back in their uh, processing sequence and see what the condition of the modules were, the wrap material was before it was unloaded, and then what the, uh, what if any of the unwrapping uh, techniques uh, could have contributed to that potential contamination event that was captured on the, on the dispersing cylinders of the feeder. So basically the process is um, the, the cameras that we have installed in the dispersing cylinder end of the feeder capture video or excuse me, capture still images of, of plastic that builds up on the rollers. Uh, and then once the, the plastic's pulled off, we can many times go back and see exactly from the RFID tag that's located, that's included in that plastic, which module that came from, and then go back in that processing log and see you know, what happened, what the condition of that wrap was as it was placed on the feeder and why, <clears throat> why we may have caught that plastic on those rollers. So here's the RFID bridge uh, and video camera system that captures that unloading uh, scenario. We have RFID antennas that, that uh, basically build us a processing log for every one of the modules that's placed on the feeder. Uh, and then that RFID scan also triggers the, the video capture of the unloading process and the unwrapping process. That's tied, as I mentioned, to the still images that are collected on the dispersing cylinder end uh, of when, whenever the module feeder slows down 
naturally in, in the ginning process enough to where we get a clear view of those, those uh, cylinders. We, we immediately snap a picture uh, of the, the cylinders and, and any plastic that's on there uh, and display that to the, uh, to the ginners so that they're able to um, stop and then go remove that material. We had a modification to this system last year where we designed a new uh, camera mount that just made the, uh, the installation of those cameras a little bit uh, easier on, on different module feeder uh, dispersing cabinet designs. Uh, some are deeper than others. Some have different uh, back wall uh, angles. And so by having that uh, camera more adjustable, it, it's just a little bit easier to, to install that system. This system has been published these, uh, you know, on the National Cotton Generators Association website uh, and also in the Journal of Cotton Science. Um, so I'll provide these links to, to Bobby later. And, and for those interested, you can, you can dig this up and, and take a look at it or, or certainly contact me and I can send you this information as well. Moving on to the colored plastic detection injection system. This is the technology, as Kent mentioned, was, is included in Viper. Um, <clears throat> we now call this system PIDES or P-I-D-E-S. Um, we had to move away from the trademark name of Viper <laughs> in our development, but essentially this is the technology that's included there. So it's a, a single board uh, computer system uh, that has a, a cell phone camera essentially mounted on the opposite side that images uh, the flow of cotton and any plastic that's in that in that system. You can see this uh, rack above the gin stand has uh, multiple uh, camera nodes installed above the, the feeder apron. And as our technician here uh, sticks this colored stick underneath there just to check and make sure that those cameras are, are actively functioning and, and firing the uh, pneumatic solenoids to eject the, the contaminant. Um, he places that colored stick under there and you can see it shoots out a little bit of cotton. That's essentially how the system uh, is designed to function. There was a lot of work that went into the design of those camera housings uh, to, to provide uh, cleaning of the lenses. Uh, it's a very dusty environment, but also help deal with the uh, thermal loads uh, from the various electronic components that are included in there. Um, so we, we've modified this design over time and and have actually now been able to get away from uh, having to use compressed air in this system, uh, which is a, a major benefit for, for gins that don't, uh, don't necessarily have extremely clean air uh, running throughout the, throughout the gin. So we don't have to install additional equipment to clean the air up just for the cameras above the gin stands. This shows the initial design of the, the air knives used to eject uh, the contaminants from the flow of seed cotton. There's a series of pneumatic solenoids that's located uh, on this particular design underneath the feeder apron, the tail of the feeder apron uh, that give that uh, burst of, of compressed air to eject the system or eject the contaminant from the system. Now these solenoids are actually located behind the, the feeder uh, to reduce the weight that's, uh, you know, that's attached to the, uh, the uh, feeder apron so that the gen operators can actually go out there and lift that a tail up and, and clear the clear any chokes that may be in the in the system. So over time, uh, we we considered several different locations for the application of this technology in the ginning process. But the the gin stand feeder apron is basically the optimal location uh, for detection and removal because it provides a probably the only location where we have a consistent, uniform, shallow depth of flow of seed cotton to where we can we can reliably see the contaminants in that flow of, of seed cotton. So this video shows how the system works. Um, see that red contaminant coming down there. The system images the contaminant, fires the solenoids and blows it out in front of the gin stand. And that's essentially uh, how the fiber system and, and PIDES uh, systems work uh, currently today. Here's some of the images of the material that's captured. Uh, this is some of the yellow plastic uh, from module wrap material. Uh, then there, here are some of the other uh, uh, contaminants that, that uh, the system is also able to see. Uh, there's a lot of this mylar uh, balloon material that we see in, in seed cotton coming out of the field, uh, as well as uh, chip bags and water bottle labels and, and various other things uh, that we've captured over the years. Some of the validation trials that were done back at the gin lab show uh, for various uh, 
colors as well as uh, sizes of contaminants, looking at the blue plastic, the pink plastic, and the yellow plastic materials from the module wrap material only. At nine bales per hour, uh, total flow rate going through the system, we're well above 90% for all sizes and all colors. But when you increase the, the processing rate to 13 plus bales per hour, uh, you drop off in, in uh, ejection efficiency for, for all the colors, but especially uh, we saw a decrease in the two by two for the blue uh, and the pink uh, predominantly uh, down to closer to 70, 50 to 70% there. So uh, this was also confirmed, you know, at this level or, or better uh, under commercial conditions at, at uh, the several different uh, commercial ginning locations that we had the Viper system installed at. Another thing that's, that's ongoing that uh, is helping to improve the system, uh, velocity estimation of these uh, contaminants as they flow down the feeder apron is an important uh, thing to take a look at because it's, as you look at seed cotton flowing down that feeder apron, it looks like it's flowing at a pretty constant rate, but when you, when you slow that down and look at it under high speed, uh, photography, the cotton and those contaminants actually kind of float down, <laughs> float down the feeder apron, and, and the the speed of that uh, material is not consistent necessarily from the top to the bottom, or it, it can be inconsistent. Uh, and so, by a, by uh, collecting multiple images of that contaminant as it progresses down the feeder apron slide, we can better predict the the uh, position and the the uh, velocity of that. Uh, contaminant and fine tune the uh, the ejection pulse uh, to where we can uh, better time the the uh, on off cycle for that pulse, but also the duration of that pulse so that we're not throwing excessive amounts of seed cotton out in front of the gin stand that the, the crew has to then go clean up. Uh, some additional work is ongoing looking at the convolutional neural networks uh, to help identify uh, black plastics and clear plastics. Um, in the flow of cotton. These are some of the harder uh, materials to detect right now. And so there's some work uh, that, that's showing some promise now to be able to detect those, uh, those materials a little bit better. Uh, and a new thing that we've put in place over the last couple of years is this uh, vision system, visual imaging single node system. It's uh, basically a single camera node uh, from the uh, PIDE system uh, that does not include uh, the ejection solenoid. So basically it's just a camera looking at the, you know, whatever 14, 12 to 14 inches of, of the gin stand width, doing a basic survey of, of what material is coming down that gin stand. And it's really there to help answer the question is, do I have a problem and how big is that problem? And so we put these on at, at several uh, gins out here in West Texas, uh, and they've helped to, to identify some of the some of the issues and, and help us figure out some, some new directions for some of the research that's going on. One of the things that's uh, <laughs> that was brought up uh, is uh, well, it's kind of hard for us to know when we have a problem because there's no display uh, for this. We basically take those cameras out there and hang them above the gin stands, and it's a manual process on our end to go in and, and look at those images and say, yep, there was plastic there, there wasn't, and basically provide a report at the end of the season. So we've developed this uh, monitoring system now to, uh, as a display for the GIN uh, crew to see the, the output of those cameras above each one of the GIN stands uh, that tells them when they have uh, plastic, it basically displays the last, uh, still image of that plastic that was captured on the gin stand. Uh, and then also the time uh, since that, that image was taken. So they can, they can see very clearly, um, you know, what, what contaminants they have, what gin stands it's happening on and, and how long it's been there. Uh, the color around each one of these images will change based on that, that duration since the last uh, image. Uh, so it changes from red to green to yellow, red being within the last five minutes, uh, yellow within the last 20 minutes, and then green within the last uh, hour, I believe is the way that's set up. Here are some of the images of the, the materials captured by those vision systems. Again, this is similar to what we saw with the Viper system. Uh, just the, the classifier does a very good job of catching not only module wrap plastic, but uh, pretty much anything else that's gonna be in that cotton that, that the crew decides to throw in there. One of the things that we're having to deal with now is the uh, um, uh, manual clearing of the feeder aprons. 
when the gin crew sticks their hand underneath there with a the stick to, to clear the feeder apron, well, it causes the system to uh, capture a, a large series of, of uh, images uh, while, they're, while they're doing that cleaning operation. So we're trying to develop some uh, deep learning models to help automatically get rid of this, uh, this situation uh, or these images uh, from, from the system and, and exclude them from consideration. So that's basically all I've got this morning in terms of the update. Uh, I don't know if there's time, Bobby, for a, a quick question or two. Yes, there's a, there's a time for question. If, if anybody has any, I don't uh, particularly see any on the, on the chat at this moment, uh, but uh, we do have time if somebody wants to send in a question. So, I mean, this is kind of maybe, a, I know that the coming off the gin stand, do you ever have plastic sandwiched in between material that gets through or does the system actually find those color changes and get rid of it? So if the, basically the, the camera systems that we've got installed there are basically looking at, at the surface of the, the cotton flow. So if that depth of flow is, is sufficient to, to block the, uh, you know, block light from coming through that, that, uh, that cotton bat or that, uh, you know, that flow going down the feeder apron. If it's blocking that plastic, we're not gonna be able to see it. But if it's, if it's there kind of intermixed somewhat and has, has changed that uh, color uh, enough uh, to, that, that the camera can detect and, and identify that as a, as a contaminant, then it, it will see it. So, but to, to be able to look through uh, a specific depth, I can't tell you exactly how deep, um, what our limitation is there, but uh, just to, to say that, it, it, that that's why we, we identified the feeder apron as the, as the location for the application of this technology so that we get that good uniform shallow depth of flow um, and, and the singulation of that cotton through there allows us to, to see those, those materials, you know, between the locks of cotton as, as best we can. Uh, we did have another question come in and it said, uh, I've heard that blue is best in previous pre presentations, but your presentation showed that yellow was best. Can you explain? Yeah, so it, it depends on the, on the materials that were, <laughs> that were, were being tested uh, and the, the way that that classifier is, is set up. Um, so Kent mentioned earlier that the blue uh, is, is very easily to detect, and, and it is. Um, I will say there is a caveat in that it depends upon how the classifier is set up, meaning you have to go in and, and train that classifier uh, specifically for the, the uh, use environment that you're, you're going to operate in. So, for example, in Kent's uh, situation over in, in the southeast, they don't tend to have much uh, yellow tinged cotton like what we have out here on the high plains under, under certain uh, environmental conditions. And so that classifier that's used on his cameras may be set up different than the ones that would be used in a gin, say out here uh, on the high plains, because what we wanna do over at Kent's gin is really look for, um, you know, we, we can fine tune it to work with uh, and, and exclude uh, say green leaf material, for example, something like that. As to where over here in the high plains, uh, where we get that yellow tinged cotton, which is very similar in color to uh, the, the yellow plastic material that's, that's coming off those modules. Sometimes we get some false positives that we have to, to, to live with, you know, there to be able to eject out the, uh, the yellow plastic uh, over here. And so the results that I showed, um, to answer your question would have to be taken with a grain of salt. I'd have to go back in there and look at exactly how those uh, classifiers were set up um, to, to really say, you know, why it was not detecting that blue as well as, as it was the yellow, but, but just to say that it, it is uh, a classifier set up situation. And uh, John, we, we appreciate you being with us today and, and uh, really good information. And uh, uh, thank you for all your, you and your crews doing to, to uh, 
help with the research of, of this particular issue. So our, Sorry, last, be here. so our last speaker on the docket today is uh, Legina Williams. And as we would, as said before, as we were preparing for, for this, uh, this seminar, uh, we wanted to include something with the equipment. Legina's right next door to us over in Corpus, and uh, they they have quite a bit of equipment that uh, the, that they manufacture. And and so we wanted to have her and and own and and let her talk about some of the things that they do and and how they are uh, some of their uh, machinery and and such. So uh, with that, uh, Legina, we appreciate you being with us this morning and. Uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Regina Williams with Stubber Equipment in Corpus Christi, Texas. Today I have my cameraman, Tony Williams, with me. I think most of you know him. Anyway, thank you, Bobby, for asking me to talk on the different types of uh, machinery and uh, protocols for handling cotton equipment. Welcome from Windy Corpus Christi. We're going to have a lot of elements, I think, working against us today, but I'll keep it pretty short and sweet and everything. So um, I told Bobby that I could talk about our stuff. I don't really know as much about other people's equipment, but I'm happy to share with what we do. So this is really kind of old hat to us. We've been doing round launch since 2007. Before John Deere released the first round module cotton picker, they wanted a way for the gins to be able to handle and unwrap the modules once they got to the gin. My dad, Jimmy Stover, developed the Stover Unwrapper, which most of you have probably heard of. Uh, we no longer are selling that wonderful machine. However, we do continue to service it for our customers. Uh, during these initial meetings, there was a lot talked about staging of modules in the field, the distance between the modules, the things that we would need to change going forward, like the chain on the module trucks and what would need to happen at the gins with regard to trying to keep as much plastic contamination out of the gin as possible. So with that being said, there's no PowerPoints for me today. I'm kind of a show and tell type of a girl. And um, so I'm going to show you my module beds. This module bed here is, we're just finishing building it. We still have to chain it today. Um, this, so we've put some strips up on here in the meantime so that you can see what we're doing. So we originally went from the traditional fleet type of chain to what we have, the round bar, which is kind of like a chain lock that was cut in half and welded on. I don't know if y'all can see that, but. Um, anyway, this is non-aggressive. There's other chain out there that does have an aggressive form on it with teeth or mountain. And to us, that went away from what we we're trying to get away from with the traditional fleet because it would puncture the chain or the plastic, excuse me, and could allow for contamination. Of course, this chain with any others has to be maintained and eventually this is gonna wear down. As it goes down the bed and steel rubs against steel, it is going to wear and sharp edges could form. So as time moves on, you still have to, the gins and the custom haulers still have to be responsible for maintaining the integrity of the chain. And when it does get wore out, it needs to be replaced. Another one of the things we talked that we have done was we went to these uh, round module rollers. It's our RMS wings, roller wings, and it just basically freewheels. I don't know if you can see me, I'm spinning it here, but it freewheels. So whenever yeah, the module truck backs up to the modules in the field, and a few of them are a little bit out of line, these freewheeling rollers help to just kind of line them up, guide them in there, and it helps a lot with the staging purposes. Um, our bed, I know that there's been a lot of discussion on the large, the modules getting larger and larger, and it is a huge issue. Our beds are from inside to inside, 104 inches wide. 
we are one of the largest, if not the largest, widest, excuse me, module beds on the market. And we have to be able to load these modules, not only in the trucks, but be able to handle them on the gin yard. And there's a lot of module feeders out there that are very, very narrow. So the modules still have to be able to go down through there. The producers just have to keep that in mind. I know they want to save money when it comes to plastic, but it's very important that we keep the size of the modules where we can all handle them, not just with the module trucks, but with the movers and at the gin and on the module feeder. Um, so that pretty much does it for our trucks. I think that we, we didn't have to make too many changes. It's really just that what the modules are sitting on, which is the chain and how we get them in there and the width. So with that being said, we'll go over here and I have two pieces of equipment that look very similar. The first one is our Stover field mover. And this is for the producer to use. Basically it attaches to the back of a tractor on the three point and he will back down the rows in the field. The arm extends out. The table sits down on the stock, so it pushes the stocks down, and then you're able to just roll the module up onto the table to carry back down into the staging area. So it's a great way, you don't have to bounce across the rows, and it does allow for the table to lay down on the stocks and not drag the plastic across it any more than it has to. The next one looks basically the same. It's the Stover Gin Mover. We kind of stay with the same names around here, but anyway, the difference is we have a valve up on top, an extra cylinder and a telescoping uh, slide arm here, along with the hooks on here. So this is used at the gin. Um, works the same basic way, but it allows the gin to take the module to the feeder, cut the wrap by hand, and then you set it down onto the module feeder. Then this telescoping arm retracts and lifts around the module, and then the operator backs away. So it's a very easy cost effective system to be able to get the modules from the yard to the module feeder and for the, be able to see the plastic come off of the hooks some people use the hooks most don't uh, to hook the plastic on so that when the arm does come off and around the module it would take the plastic and then whoever's working the module feeder would then take and remove the wrap that way. So that's about it for us um, between our equipment and the things we have done. Bobby, I don't know if y'all, if anybody has any other questions for us. Yes, we do have a, a question here. Is it, okay. Can module trucks be retrofitted with RMS rollers? Um, I had that question not too long ago. Uh, well, if it's a Stover truck, yes, of course. Um, if it's a different type, I believe they would just have to figure out a way to attach uh, the sidewall here. I'll let you see it. Let me, this is how we do our state pockets. It would just be depending on how they mount to theirs but our, again it's a it's a freewheeling roller and it just used to we had a triangle shape and we went to this so everything can pretty much be adapted most jenners are pretty pretty good at that but if they want to discuss that more with me they're welcome to call i don't see any more questions and uh Again, we appreciate you uh, being available and, and uh, uh, showing us what your uh, uh, pieces of equipment do and how they work. And, and it's, all, it's all part of the, part of the process going forward. And, and again, thank you for being with us today and, and uh, uh, we'll finish up the meeting. Thank you very much, Bobby. Bye-bye.
So as we uh, get toward the end and kind of have a wrap up here, I, I welcome any of our speakers that are uh, still with us today. If you have any extra comments or uh, that you would like to share with us, uh, 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 unmute and, and let us know. Uh, just uh, from from my perspective, uh, they're uh, they're you know it's very interesting to see how how all the facets of the industry are are, are basically uh, doing what they can to uh, get this problem uh, you know the reduction down and and to do as good a, a job as they can to uh, getting these contaminants out. Uh, I do have a survey and it will be, the, the link here will be posted in just a second. There's also gonna be a, a, a QR code that uh, you can uh, use as well. If you're, but uh, do hope that uh, you will fill this survey out. It kind of gives us some perspective of uh, how it, uh, how it uh, worked and, and the information that was passed on. And, and uh, so uh, if you will, please fill that survey out if anyone needs the results or wants the results of the survey, we're, we're happy to uh, uh, pass those out as well when we get them uh, compiled. So if you, if you need that, uh, you're welcome to email me and uh, I will see about getting those to you. Uh, this seminar has been recorded. And so there again, once we get the uh, finished version put together, uh, it will be available for anyone to use in, in programming purposes. Uh, uh, feel free if you can't you can't find it, get get in touch with me, and I will uh, again send it to you. So, uh, with that said, is it, any of our previous uh, uh, presenters have any comments or uh, that they would like to share? If not, I, I, again, uh, on behalf of myself, uh, Jaime, do you have anything you'd like to, to share with us? Yes, Bobby, thank you. I want to just thank everyone for uh, everything that they've done for us. I appreciate you putting this together and all of our participants uh, working with us and getting all this information out to, uh, to our, all of our constituents. And anyone out there, if there is any questions or anything that we can help you with, please feel free to give us a call, either Bobby or or myself, uh, we're here to help in any way that we can answer any questions. If we uh, don't have the answers, we will get that information, those answers for you. But, uh, again, thank you, Bobby, very much for, for putting this together. Appreciate all your help. Thank you, Jaime. And uh, we, we, uh, we enjoy, that I have, we have enjoyed putting this together. Uh, got another question. Is there evidence of a temperature-related level of contamination from plastic wrap? Anyone want to? John, you still on? I am still here. Okay. Would you like to take a stab at that? Again, address it from the standpoint of the uh, adhesives uh, from the, the camera wrap materials. They have two different configurations of that material. There's an Arctic wrap and a standard wrap, uh, and those are intended to be used in different uh, storage environments. So the Arctic wrap would be used uh, or would be used in uh, colder environments where the standard wrap uh, is acceptable to be used in uh, warmer environments. Now, if you use the standard wrap uh, in colder environments, you would expect to see that uh, adhesive uh, tend to fail uh, a little bit easier uh, than you would compared to the Arctic wrap. And so you may see higher incidence uh, of uh, wrap failures under lower, lower temperature conditions with the standard wrap. Uh, we have seen with the other materials, not the Tamar wrap, but say the orange uh, SMA wrap, uh, that when that material is in cold environments, that that adhesive tends to fail very quickly. Uh, and so that, that produces a, a situation where you have high potential for, for plastic contamination. Thank you, John. 
I don't see any other questions. So uh, again, uh, I want to thank all the all the presenters this morning, and and I think there was some really good information that that transpired uh, just in looking at you know we I think we all understand and and view the the uh, the issue from from the beginning to the end and it, the uh, amount of effort that it takes from every segment to uh, to do their part to to try to eliminate the eliminate the the uh, problem of uh, plastic contamination in the cotton. So with that said, I see no other questions. Again, thank you for being here today. And with that, uh, I guess we'll uh, end the meeting. <laughs>